Okay, welcome back to the podcast. Today's episode is about Freud, particularly the essay Morning and Melancholia from 1917, and then also a little bit at the end about a short essay he wrote called Repeating, Remembering, and Working Through. One thing I have to say before I begin the discussion of the 1917 essay is that although, well, that it's written before his 1920 essay, Beyond the Pleasure Principle, and because of the order of the Black Mirror episodes and putting together all these readings uh, as if they were kind of puzzle pieces, um, we discussed, or I, you know, had, I discussed the uh, Beyond the Pleasure Principle first. And that essay comes after this one I'm about to discuss, 1917's Morning and Melancholia. And that, that creates a complication uh, that I'll, I'll mention in a moment. But the subject of this essay is melancholia, and it's worth, um, for those unfamiliar with that term, explaining its origins. I think it's quite interesting. So it, it means what we mean nowadays by the term depression. And uh, it's an ancient word. It comes from the Greek melancholia. And the uh, Greek physician Hippocrates and the, the Hippocratic tradition that followed from him had a theory of the body's four humors, uh, blood, uh, phlegm, black bile, and yellow bile. So, of course, there are other, other bodily fluids, but those are the four that Hippocrates emphasized. And the theory of health, according to that uh, medical theory, was that the healthy person had all four humors in balance, so that somebody who had uh, excess blood um, would be cured by bloodletting, by putting a leech on their arm or opening their veins and, and draining their blood. And that treatment persisted in the West uh, up to uh, the, the 19th century, including uh, doctors in the 19th century. Uh, so it's not that long ago that this humoral theory fell out of favor, fortunately, because, of course, what could be worse for somebody who's feverish than in draining their blood? Well, anyway, it wasn't uh, just that physical ailments were understood, according to this humoral theory, but also psychological ailments as well. And in fact, there was a theory of character that everybody was, um, well, not everybody, but people were often... Uh, favored one humor or the other, so that someone who had, on the whole, more blood than your average person relative to the other humors in their body was called a, a sanguine person, an optimistic person. Um, someone with too much phlegm uh, constitutionally was a phlegmatic person. And somebody with too much black bile was a melancholic. Melon, from we have melanoma, dark spot on your skin, uh, that's cancerous. That's That's the black melon, and then chole was the bile. So Someone who is um, melancholic, as opposed to just merely bilious, someone who's melancholic uh, is a depressive. And Freud has in mind uh, symptoms that we still use uh, or that we still see in the case of depressives. The ones he mentions are, are quite common, insomnia and a lack of appetite. And then he speaks of a diminished self-regard, which... Uh, means guilt in this case. So the, the depressive person not just is sleepless and doesn't eat, but feels guilty that uh, he's done something wrong. But what goes along with that guilt is a peculiar mixture of an absence of shame. So you know, you, typically when people feel they've done something wrong, they don't want it uh, broadcast. But the, the depressive or the melancholic is peculiar because although he feels guilty that he's done something terribly wrong, he speaks of it constantly and tells other people about it as if he has no shame. In fact, Freud notices, I think quite astutely, that the melancholic takes great satisfaction in this self-exposure. He's getting pleasure out of advertising his guilt. Uh, and what goes along with that guilt is an exaggerated feeling of responsibility. So uh, you know, somebody who, uh, a survivor's guilt, for example, uh, could be uh, part of uh, depressive symptoms. And uh, the survivor feels guilty as if somehow the survivor is responsible for the death of the other or the other people in, in some situation. So along with this uh, set of symptoms finally goes masochism. That is uh, not sexual masochism, particularly uh, what Freud later calls moral masochism. So the 
the self-flagellation, uh, especially in the presence of other people, the, the bringing on oneself of, of shame and opprobrium, uh, the seeking of social stigma uh, that's uh, typical of, of this person. So Freud, uh, I mean, at the base of this treatise, Morning of Melancholia, Freud just wants to understand why in the world would anybody experience this strange constellation of symptoms? You know, depression is common enough in our society, as in as in most, that uh, it's easy to sort of take it for granted as a, a, a fact of human life. But it's if you believe, as Freud did at this point in 1917, that human beings operate fundamentally according to the pleasure principle, which is to say that we are pleasure-seeking organisms, then a person who uh, experiences masochism, moral masochism, this general sense of, of um, seeking um, misfortune, that uh, that's a mystery. And it's it's easier to say, to, to meet this phenomenon by saying, well, people, some people, maybe all people are inherently masochistic. And that's the turn he takes in Beyond the Pleasure Principle that I've uh, already uh, discussed in a previous episode. He finally is not able, he thinks, by that point to explain all human behavior according to the pleasure principle. But here in 1917, he's still operating with the fundamental um, motivation of human beings being pleasure. And as a result, masochism is a mystery for him. So it's not just this constellation of symptoms that's a mystery, but it's masochism more generally that's that's a problem. And the way he goes about explaining melancholia in this little essay is to say effectively that it's mourning that's gone wrong. So that raises the question of what mourning is. Well, mourning for Freud is when, um, first of all, it happens against the background of love. So uh, before the loss happens, the person, the self is in love or feels love towards another. Uh, in this case, we're using a term that he established earlier in his career, that sounds a little strange, but it's quite helpful. The, the term is object. So the, we, we speak nowadays of a love object. Someone has a love object or they've lost their love object, the object of their love. In this case, the self is in love or feels love towards an object, a person. And the person dies or they um, get divorced or there's a betrayal. The person is lost somehow. And Freud's model... Uh, stemming from his theory of sex and love from 1905, from the three essays on sexuality that I'll discuss in a future episode. His model is that there is this, there are drives, especially the libidinal drive, libido, that goes out towards uh, the object. So uh, it's handy to have a diagram, you know, a circle would be the self, and then there's a force kind of, sort of emanating from that circle towards the object, as if it's reaching out and grabbing that object. So it's a drive. And this is, of course, a metaphorical representation, but I mentioned, you know, in the previous episode, um, when I was discussing, discussing Solomon on surreality, that you can be in love with somebody and then told that they're dead. Uh, you cognitively, rationally recognize that they're dead, but there's something in you that's still reaching out for them as if they're in the world. And so uh, an example of this might be, um, you know, your husband dies and the next morning uh, you go down to breakfast, go down to the kitchen, and he used to, when he was alive, be up before you making coffee every morning. And when you go down that first morning, you expect him to be there. You, you know, you, again, you, when you think about it, you know that he's dead. You remember what happened. You've you know, been to the funeral or whatever, but that you, your, your body expects that that person to be there. You expect the smell of the coffee. And when it's not there, it's a shock. It's a shock to, in Solomon's terms, your surreality. Well, that's what the metaphor of, that I described earlier, the diagram of the kind of force emanating from the self towards the object is. That's the libido in, in Freud's terms. Although crucially, Freud thinks that no libido, no love or desire for another is ever pure. He has one possible exception that's kind of embarrassing, I think, for him, and that is he thinks that the a mother's love for her firstborn son, he was a firstborn son and and, and loved his mother. He thought that that's going to be a pure love. But but that that kind of sentimentality aside, Freud thought that all other loves were 
ambivalent, which is they were mixed with another drive, the aggressive drive, the one that he'll later call in that Beyond the Pleasure Principle treatise, the death drive, but at this moment, simply aggression. So that whenever a self is in love with an object, the libido stretches out towards that object, but so too does the aggression. So that every love relationship is mixed with aggression. And, you know, I mentioned Hegel in the last episode again, and, if, you know, that master-slave dialectic is so helpful for understanding all sorts of human relationships. One thing that it teaches is that if you think of love as a special type of recognition, when two people meet and are each seeking recognition or love from one another, if Hegel's abstractly right about the possibilities of that interaction, that, um, that, that it has to be achieved through some kind of conflict. And the, the Pygmalion story is an illustration of that, that Pygmalion's not going to get the love that he seeks because his object, the ivory girl, doesn't, there's no conflict. She'll do everything that he wants. And, and Martha experiences the same thing with, with the robot Ash. He's programmed to do everything that she wants. And because she doesn't get resistance, because he won't fight back, she doesn't get the love that she's looking for. So again, I think that's, Philosophical evidence, if you like, a structural expectation that love will always be mixed with aggression or, or there will be conflict at any rate. And that, that the, the fantasy of, of pure love, love without conflict is, is indeed just that, a fantasy. Freud thought that the evidence for the mixture or the ambivalence of aggression and love, that that came from his clinical work. So take it for granted, at least for understanding Freud, that love and aggression are mixed together. And that will become important in the understanding of melancholy in a moment. But in the picture of mourning, you've got the self with this force or mixture of forces reaching out towards an object. Then the object disappears. In mourning, this normal process, there's a gradual withdrawal of the libido mixed with the aggression away from that empty space where the object was. And because we're driven to love in Freud's theory, uh, as well as to hate, because the drives seek expression, that withdrawal must be temporary. But because it's been withdrawn from that particular object, object one, it then gets reinvested in object two. And this is the straightforward case of uh, the husband dies, the wife comes down, every morning and you know weeps because he's not there to make coffee but eventually the tears dry and she still loves him uh, loves his memory uh, continues to rationally believe of course that he's dead but her heart stops reaching out every morning and what metaphorically what that uh, is is the the retraction of the libido the withdrawal of the libido uh, away from the missing object and because she's driven to love if Freud's right then she'll find a sub, another one. I was going to say a sub, substitute. She'll find uh, a second husband, another another object to love. It doesn't even have to be a person. It could the the energy has been withdrawn from the husband. The energy is now available to be reinvested, whether in another person or in a religion or in, or at work, in a pet, uh, whatever. So that is mourning. That's the healthy process. And I mentioned in the last episode that. Solomon gave us a way of understanding mourning through his notion of surreality, that Martha had one surreality when Ash was alive and shortly after he died, and that by the end of the episode she has a different surreality. Well, if mourning succeeded in that episode, eventually, I think it did, then Freud's given us a way of understanding what happens, that the libido or the, the desire mixed perhaps with aggression and anger, conflict, the... Um, the libido that she had at the beginning was constitutive of her surreality, and then it gets withdrawn from an object, and that object kind of disappears from the surreality, and as a result, there's a new space, and it's not going to be, it could be just a substitution of a, of a new person right into the slot. I'll discuss that when it comes to repeating, remembering, and working through, but the surreality in a healthy case will start shifting and changing so that the, when the libido is reinvested in a new person there's a there's going to be a new place available and somewhere else in the surreality for that for that new place when the new person the new religion the new pet or whatever comes along at any rate that's healthy mourning freud's model for melancholia is based on that but that something goes wrong 
And uh, straightforwardly what happens is rather than the libido being retracted because the object has disappeared, the object is withdrawn along with the libido into the self. Now, again, that's abstract and, and metaphorical. What he means, I think, is that at some level, the person has simply not accepted that the person has died or, or has has left or betrayed or, or any, this is supposed to work for any kind of loss. Now, he doesn't think that, um, you know, if you ask if you ask the, the wife in, in the scenario I imagine, is your husband still alive? He doesn't think that she'll say, yes, he's still alive. That would be a psychotic. Here, Freud is not talking about psychotics. But the question wouldn't be answered by her conscious, rational report about the life of her husband, but rather by her behavior and her inner life that would become available upon free association or in, in, a, in, a, in an analysis of her dreams. And in Solomon's terms, the surreality that existed when the husband was alive and then shortly after he died, that if that persists, in other words, if the emotional constitution that she had upon the death of her husband simply doesn't change because the place where her husband was is unchanged. Because the reality has changed, how can that be? Because all that mattered in the case of Solomon was the surreality, that is the interpretations and the evaluations, those emotional judgments. If those remain exactly the same, and remember they're pre-verbal, they can be pre-conscious, then the process of mourning doesn't happen. She, rem she remains emotionally stuck. And what is she investing her libido in now? Well, it's not available to be reinvested elsewhere because it continues to be invested in the object. But now because the object is dead and is not in reality, the, the object is there still in the surreality, or we would say in the imagination. So Freud, that's why Freud talks about the withdrawal of the object into the mind. Again, the actual person is not here, not the object. It's the object of the desire. So a, a fantasy of the person um, lives on in the mind of the person. Now again, in healthy mourning, we'll continue to remember and to, to dream about, uh, fantasize, if you will, as well, the, the dead person or the, or the person who's, who's left because of a divorce or, or a betrayal. We'll still fantasize and imagine and, and remember that person, but we won't do so as if the person is still alive, even um, unconsciously. And in the case of melancholia, that continues to happen uh, as if the person were still alive, I should say. So what is pathological about this? Well, first of all, there isn't the reinvestment of energy. So the person gets stuck. Uh, life becomes repetitive. But also, crucially, the ambivalence I mentioned earlier, where the libido is, is woven together with aggression, because that remains uh, attached to the object, but now as an inner object, as something that's been absorbed or internalized into the mind, uh, the hostility that was always woven into that libido will now also be uh, attached to something inside. And in, in Freud's uh, phrase, the shadow of the object falls upon the ego. So the ego here is the self. And as the, as the object is withdrawn into the self, uh, it gets absorbed into the self so that the emotions that were or the drives that were directed towards the object now get directed towards the self so that whereas before the person was their love was directed outward now their love is directed towards themselves this explains why they have this exaggerated sense of responsibility and um, also why they have this exaggerated sense of guilt because the guilt satisfies the hostility that they now feel towards himself before it might have been anger at the other person now it's it's guilt about their own self because of the way the uh, self is absorbed uh, excuse me the way the object is absorbed into into the self so this gives Freud his explanation for the insomnia and the lack of appetite these are hostile energies being directed at the self and impeding its basic functions he's explained the guilt and the exaggerated responsibility, the, the delight in exposure, uh, the attention that's uh, being gained, and the absence of shame, because the, the shame and opprobrium that might attach now to the self, the person, the self itself, is feeling gratified by, because then it gets to punish um, 
the object, which is now identified with itself. And so we have an explanation for the masochism that was so mysterious to Freud. Well, now let me say a few words about repeating, remembering, and, and working through. When we are melancholic, uh, when we've withdrawn the object as well as the libido into the self, as I mentioned, it isn't available to be reinvested elsewhere. So instead now of uh, seeking a new love, what we do is we repeat the pattern of the old love. Now, that can mean that we don't reinvest our energies into a new person or a pet or religion or the other candidates I mentioned earlier, or we could have a relationship with a new person, it's at, you know, those other objects as well, and it would be flat because the emotional energy that needs to be invested into a relationship to give it life is not available. It's still being invested in that now internal object. So, so far I've mentioned two options. There are going to be three eventually, but the, but the, uh, the first, first was the person gets stuck and simply doesn't move on to any new object. The second is that the person moves on to a new object, but does so in a flat, uh, affectless way because that energy is just not available to be reinvested. The third, and this is sort of the more, more common and more interesting, is that uh, a new object is found, a new person, I should say, is found, and there is the energy that characterized the previous relationship as well, but merely because the new person is considered just another avatar of the, the, the first object. And this is an illustration of the, the general phenomenon that Freud calls by the name of transference, where we take attitudes, fantasies, emotions from previous relationships and we apply them to the present without noticing the differences in the present. We're repeating. This typically happens, he thinks, with the relationships we have with our parents and perhaps our siblings when we're young, and that we reproduce those patterns over and over again in our adult life. And I, I, I mentioned uh, in discussion of Freud's Beyond the Pleasure Principle, the examples he gives of transference, the, the man who continually raises um, uh, his students to the heights of fame only to be uh, treated with ingratitude by them. And that was apparently an experience that Freud had over and over again. He realizes that repetitive experiences like that are not uh, a fate you know, imposed by the gods, but rather the fate or destiny that is character. And then he gives now, in this case, a particular explanation of how that fate works uh, in the mind. It works because people have become melancholics rather than properly mourning because they, at some level, have not accepted that the loss really happened. And so they, they keep the person alive by, by taking them into their self. So that's repeating, but the title of that other essay is Repeating, Remembering, and Working Through. And I mentioned that Jonathan Lear, the psychoanalyst and philosopher, has said that one could reconstruct all of Freud or maybe even all of psychoanalysis, if I, if I remember, from that, this one essay alone. So what, what else is going on in that essay besides re the, this description of repeating? Well, remembering, so repeating, uh, Freud thinks in this little essay, is an unconscious activity. The person who is continually having the same kind of relationship over and over again, breaking up in exactly the same way that the relationship goes in exactly the same way. That's an unconscious process. The person is not saying, I want to keep doing this. They just simply keep doing it. They're not sure why. Repeating is our destiny when we are not aware of the patterns. I mean, we might be aware of the patterns that are happening in life. We're not aware, I should say, of the unconscious structure. We're not aware of the, of the, the melancholia, to assimilate it with the other essay. We're not aware of the fact that we have withdrawn old objects into the self and that we are simply continuing to love those old objects and finding um, substitutes uh, that are just playing the same role. Remembering, by contrast, is bringing the unconscious into the conscious, making the unconscious conscious. By remembering uh, the things that we've become melancholic about, we can decide, Freud thinks, to mourn them. That is to come to accept that they no longer exist in reality. And here I'm blending it with Solomon's terms. Uh, I find I find these two explanations complementary. We, through remembering uh, the exercise of reason, or in Solomon's terms, the judgment we make about our judgments, 
we are able to revise those original judgments. We are able to check our surreality against reality. And so the person who has a series of romantic relationships over and over again um, with the same kind of man can uh, begin analysis wondering, why in the world am I doing this? It might not even know that she's doing it. it. might be only become aware that she's doing it because of the help of the analyst and seeing the pattern and then wonder, why in the world am I doing that? And through free association, come to a recognition that she's reproducing a pattern that she experienced, say, with her father. Uh, and that by remembering that, she can then decide whether that's, in fact, um the right way to live? Is that the best way to live for her? And if she judges that the judgments that constitute that approach to life, you know, a whole set of emotions, anger, let's say, that is the sort that spoils her relationships one after the other, or guilt, as is typical of the melancholic, you know, the, the exaggerated sense of responsibility she might feel for the withdrawal of her father's love, we can imagine, or the, if, he, if he left due to a divorce and she felt responsible as a five-year-old girl, it, and so on. Uh, you know, when you're describing psycholytic uh, examples, the, the problem is you either talk about real cases, which are so complex, and if they're real cases, you might be betraying the anonymity of or the confidentiality of the patient, or, or real uh, cases that have been turned into some anonymous account. They're, they're just so complex, they would take up all our time, or you resort to these cliches, and so I'm, I'm going to have to resort to, to cliches in this case. So when she remembers, that's when there's the opportunity to do what Freud calls, in the English translation, working through. What is working through? He's never quite explicit about this, even even in this essay that I'm uh, referring to here. But I, again, think that Solomon is helpful, that the working through is a readjustment of the surreality, to check the surreality against reality and judge whether those judgments are accurate. And I guess the the final point I want to make before just returning to be right back and checking these thoughts against that film is this reminds me of Plato's cave where the philosophical journey is moving away from images, which are a kind of surreality to uh, uh, higher and higher levels of reality or, or more real reality than the um, surreality at the bottom of the cave. I suppose the difference between Solomon and Plato on this point is that Plato thinks you can escape the images and become one with the real, uh, leave behind the images. Solomon doesn't think that's possible. We always, as human beings, live in a surreality. We can get our surreality closer to reality, I think, but uh, we can never leave surreality behind. And, and, and Plato seems to think that too for us so long as we inhabit human bodies. The, the escape into pure reality for Plato, if it happens, happens only upon death, which is why he calls philosophy a preparation for death. So let, let's check these Freudian theories against the events of Be Right Back and see whether they help us understand the episode uh, and vice versa. Well, I mentioned uh, in the um, previous episode when I discussed Solomon and be right back that I do think that the mourning, uh, I, th I do think that she successfully mourns, Martha successfully mourns Ash throughout that episode, but that it's a, a twisted path, especially when the robot, the embodied Ash robot arrives. I think that complicates things for her. Um, the email, I guess, also does because her surreality remains the same in the Sol Solomon terms. So I guess I want to say that in Freud's terms, she doesn't mourn successfully at first, that she remains melancholic. And it's, it's a quite good, clear illustration uh, of the problem of melancholia because when she's got that email and, and voice communication with the incorporeal ash simulacrum, her heart has not accepted that he's died. She's acting as if he is still alive. And part of her knows that he isn't. I mean, if her sister says, is, is Ash alive? She'll say no. Uh, but notice she's ashamed of what she's doing with the, uh, with this, this service because she doesn't tell her sister about it, um, at, at any point. Uh, certainly not after the Ash robot arrives. So part of her knows that 
Ash is dead. Her reason knows that Ash is dead. And that same part of her seems ashamed of what she's doing, that this isn't helping. But her heart can't resist. Her heart has reasons that her reason doesn't understand. And she um, keeps acting at that level as if he's still alive. That's just a very good example of bringing the object into the ego, letting the, uh, the shadow of the object fall upon the ego and and remaining in the same emotional consti constitution, acting as if he's he's still alive. Well, we discussed Hegel in the previous episode, uh, the way in which Hegel helps understand the Pygmalion story, why it is that without resistance from the other and the conflict that that resistance generates, that genuine recognition or love can't be achieved, it's through that dialectic, that, through that master-slave encounter, that Martha experiences the shortcomings of her melancholic world, and that's when she begins to reject the Ash robot. And I think when we get that final scene, we, we're, 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 we're collapse. What's collapsed is that process of of rejection of the Ash robot, which resumes the mourning process, which was interrupted when she got pregnant and started that email service. So in the terms of the other essay of Freud, she has uh, stopped repeating. Has she remembered? Uh, well, not in the sense in which Freud is talking about, because here the memory is not going to be of her infantile childhood relationships with her parents. Um, this isn't a distant event that she's dealing with, but rather something as fresh as a few months ago. But she's certainly working through. She's taking the, to use Solomon's terms again, she's taking that surreality where Ash is still very much alive and she's decomposing it and reconstituting it as a new surreality where, where Ash is dead. And if Freud's right, or this combination of Freud and Solomon that I've put together for this episode is correct, that means that she won't have to repeat any longer. She won't, uh, not, she won't simply put Ash Robot into a, into an addict and then find another man who's just like Ash or find a religion that will do for her what her love for Ash did for her in some kind of the way that would make her stuck. Neither will she find everything unsatisfying and not be able to invest any emotional energy into anything, the second option. Uh, I'm trying to remember how we got in all three. But instead, she will now uh, have new energy available to invest in a, in a genuinely new object into a new person or a new religion or a new pet or a new job or whatever, uh, that life will, will resume for her as a creative uh, endeavor looking towards the future rather than a repetition of the past. 